Funding for this edition of Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been provided by PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. The New Jersey Education Association. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, here when you need us most. Prudential Financial. New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT, makes industry-ready professionals in all STEM fields. And by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And by bestofnj.com. All New Jersey in one place. Hi, everyone. Steve Adubato for Remember Them. More importantly, my colleague, Jackie Tricarico, our executive producer and co-anchor. Jackie, we recognize um, and remember James J. Braddock, otherwise known as Cinderella Man, the, the iconic movie played by Russell Crowe, all about Cinderella Man. We interview Henry Haskop, who's the president of the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. What did you take from that interview? Well, I think it's just so important to note that Braddock really became a symbol for so many people during a time in our country, the Great Depression, where there wasn't a lot of hope, right? There was just so much turmoil. And, uh, you know, he became the symbol of somebody. He really was the rags to riches story, uh, where he started with nothing, worked so hard, and became a champion, really, in boxing. And boxing at that time was just one of the biggest sports in, in America and everyone was watching and he became a symbol for those people that, uh, you know, things could get turned around and, and things could, could get better. So, you know, what's so interesting is, and we tried to talk about this with Henry Haskop. We didn't have enough time to really get into it. So James J. Braddock has a very interesting up and down boxing career comes out of Northern uh, New Jersey. The, the, I'm uh, pretty sure it was the Hudson County area. Um, Working class family, as Jackie said, it's Cinderella man. He fights for the heavyweight championship against the great people. Can't appreciate this, but as a boxing, a student of boxing, Max Bear, he was knocking people out left and right. He was the heavyweight champion, killed one guy. Another guy he fought wound up passing later after a few fights. Point being, he was vicious. He was bigger, stronger than James Braddock. James Braddock has no chance against him. A 10 to 1 underdog. His wife, James Braddock's wife, and others in his church went and prayed not that Braddock would win, but that he would survive the fight and not get killed or get hurt seriously. We tell that story um, about the great uh, James Braddock. And also, Jackie, for me, the other thing I took from it was that he, he had grit. I'm, I'm a fan of the word grit. This guy never gave up. Odds or no odds, right? Nope. He never gave up. And that's depicted in the movie Cinderella Man, too. And I definitely watched that with Russell Crowe back in 2005. And um, it just, of course, it's a Hollywood movie, right? And, and kind of depict him in even a bigger light than he was. But Braddock didn't ever give up. And he retired, um, you know, with his last win. Um, and, you know, he he passed away in North Bergen, uh, in North Bergen, New Jersey in uh, 1974. But his legacy definitely lives on. Can't forget people like... People go, oh, Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali, the great champion. You're right. But then there was Cinderella Man, James J. Braddock. In the second half, Jackie and I will uh, talk about an interview that she did all about the great Althea Gibson right over there. But right now, the Cinderella Man, James J. Braddock. We're now joined by Henry Haskop, who is president and boxing historian of the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. How you doing, Henry? I'm doing well. How about you? Doing great. There's Cinderella Man, the great book written by our great friend Jeremy Schapp. Uh, check that out. But Henry knows more about boxing than anyone else I know. Henry, let me ask you something. The name Cinderella Man, for, for James J. Braddock, where does Cinderella Man come from, the name? Well, Cinderella Man came from a, a 
a sports writer by the name of Damian Runyon. The he, Damian Runyon. Yes, yes. He, he was very famous. He gave uh, a lot of uh, nicknames to fighters like the Manassa Mauler, Jack Dempsey, the Toy Jack Bowl. Dempsey. Was, uh, and did he call? Did he call Joe Lewis the, the Brown Bomber? Yeah, well, he he did, but somebody I think somebody else coined him him, him that one. But uh, Mickey. But where Walker, does Southern Cinderella Man come from? The name, well, like, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, like uh, relief to royalty. It was a book by uh, an old time uh, boxing writer, Lud Shabazian. He wrote the book. He was a good friend of the Cinderella Man, James J. Braddock. You know, James J. Braddock was on 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 uh, public relief. You know, he was working in the docks at four dollars an hour. He had to walk like four or five miles just to get to the docks and make like four dollars an hour. We're talking about and, the Depression, so people yeah, need to put yeah. this in perspective. We're talking about the 1930s. Um, he's on he's on government assistance, otherwise known as welfare. He ultimately paid the money back later. But how the heck does he go from that? to fighting for the heavyweight championship on June 13, 1935 against uh, Max, Max Bear, 10 to one underdog, uh, James Braddock was. People were worried that he was gonna get killed. Yes, well, let me, let me go back. You know, James J. Braddock was a pretty good amateur fighter. You know, he, he won the state titles in both light heavyweight and heavyweight divisions in 1925 and 26. In Jersey? And he, yeah, in New Jersey. Okay. They weren't called the Golden Gloves then, but they were called Amateur Boxing Championships. <laughs> but uh, and then he turned pro, and he had a very successful pro career. He won, like, uh, he was undefeated in his first 38 fights. And, uh, you know, he finally got a shot at, uh, at the light heavyweight title against Tommy Loughran. Did and, he fight uh, it? Oh, um, because then we call it a heavyweight championship. But heavyweights were not as big as they are today was he even 200 pounds i don't think he even think he was oh, no, no he wasn't 200 pounds even when he won the won these uh titles uh and the amateurs he was like 160 just over 160 pounds and he won the heavyweight championship he was going against guys 220 and he's still winning but as far as a pro goes i mean you know like i said he won his first he was undefeated in his first 38 fights then he fought a guy by the name of pet pete uh Latso. He was rated number five in the world in the light heavyweight division, and he beat him. In fact, he broke his jaw. Then he beat uh, Tuffy Griffin, who had a streak of 35 uh, fights in a row without a loss, and uh, you know, he stopped him in his second round. Then he fought uh, Jimmy Slattery, and he stopped him in nine. Then he got a shot at Tommy Loughran. So when so, does he get so, – so he gets a shot at the title. He's a 10-to-1 underdog. People uh, in, in his community were going to church praying that James J. Braddock, Cinderella Man, would not get killed or hurt. How the heck does he beat? Now, put Max Bear in perspective. If I'm not mistaken, Max Bear had killed two other men in the ring. He was that violent. He was that powerful. How the heck does Braddock win that fight? Well, let's go back after he fought Lockman. He lost. And in the next 31 bouts that he had, counting the Lockman fight, he only won nine of them. He was like a like a tomato can, you know. He, he tomato he can in boxing, everything. known as someone who is easy to beat. Go ahead. Yeah, he, he broke his hands several times, his collarbone. He was taking fights on the last minute notice. Then he fought a guy by the name of uh, Abe Feldman, and uh, he broke his hand in a million pieces. He couldn't even use it, so he had to. You know, he couldn't box it. He anymore. broke his right hand. So the left hand, yeah. did that left hand become more powerful? Well, the left hand he had to use when he went down to the docks and started working at the docks because he lost all his money at, when uh, the stock market crashed. He owned uh, a fleet of uh, taxi cabs and uh, nobody could afford even taking a taxi cab at the time. So he would, you know, he lost all his money. So he went down to docks and he, he started working, and he had to work with his left hand, his left hand, left hand over and over again. He couldn't use his right hand. It was in a cast, you know, so his, his left hand got stronger and stronger and stronger. So this is what it was. And then he still wasn't making as enough m m money, so he had to go on relief. He was getting like $24 a week, you know, on relief. I got to ask you, Henry, I got to deal with time. How the heck does he meet, beat Max Bear, 
Again, he loses the title uh, after he beats Max Baer two years later in 1937. He loses to the great Joe Lewis. How the heck does he meet, beat Max Baer? Well, you got to go back to, let's say, from June 13th, 1934 to June 13th, 1935. In one year's time, he beat three, you know, somewhat good good opponents. Uh, Corn Griffin who they were raising up to be one of the best. And uh, he uh, he stopped Griffin in three rounds. Then it was, of course, uh, John Henry Lewis. He beat him. Then he beat Art Lasky. He beat him. And then he got a shot at Max Bear. Max Bear was a 10-to-1 favorite. And 10 to he, one. he killed two two people in the ring. He actually only killed one, Frankie Campbell. He, uh, you know, a lot of people give him uh, credit. Of, I hate to say credit. But uh, Ernie Shaft, but Ernie Shaft, uh, he fought four more times before he he was actually okay. killed. But so what I, what I want to I want to focus on the fight for a moment. Given how powerful Max Bear was, would overpower people consistently, and Braddock being smaller, be, was he faster? How the heck did he win that fight? Well, he said he was he was fighting for milk, you know he. You know, what it was, he was fighting for his family. You know, Max Bear, he was more or less a, a clown. He didn't take Braddock seriously. And Braddock trained, you know, being that he rested his right arm, you know, you know, for months and used his left arm. His left got stronger and stronger all the time. And so he was ready for the fight. Max Bear wasn't. And when uh, that day came, you know, people were actually praying, you know, his wife, May, she went to the church and, uh, you know, she went to, to pray, you know, for her husband. In fact, when she got there, the church was, had a lot of people there. And what praying. town was that in? What town was that in? This was uh, St. Joseph's in Palisades. That's the, Palisades, New Jersey. Yeah, that's uh, that's the church she went to. And uh, she was praying that uh, he wouldn't get hurt because, uh, you know, they were saying Max Bear's a killer. And then as, as the fight went along, you know, that, you know, round after round, you know, they say, oh, Braddock made it out of the first round. Braddock made it out of, out of the fifth round. And by the seventh round, that's when Bear, you know, clocked Braddock pretty good. And, and uh, But uh, Braddock survived. And then by the tenth round, people saying, geez, maybe Braddock has a good shot because, I, you know, we think he's winning. And, and as time went on and on, and then uh, the final bell, you know, most of the people like went wild. I'm, I'm not going to say the fight was a thriller in Manila because it wasn't. It, it was a pretty dull fight. But the thing was that people were excited because they were waiting for Max Bear to land that big right hand and put Jimmy Braddock away. And he hey, Henry, did. I wish, uh, you know, 15 rounds at the time, now 12, you only a certain amount of time. And so, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Henry, I want to thank you for putting uh, the Cinderella man, James J. Braddock from New Jersey, uh, into perspective. We appreciate it, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. Remember Them. We'll be right back. To watch more Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico, find us online and follow us on social media. PSENG is building the utility of the future, a future where people use less energy and it's cleaner, safer, and delivered more reliably than ever. We are modernizing to lower emissions, support more renewables and electric vehicles, and reduce outages. And we are empowering our customers. At PSE&G, we are powering progress. We now look at an extraordinary figure, not just because she was a great tennis player, a golfer, a great athlete, but a great American figure, Althea Gibson. Jackie, you have a terrific interview people are about to see. Set it up for us. 
Yeah, with Dr. Ashley Brown, who recently wrote a, a new book all about Althea Gibson. And, uh, you know, we really talk about her childhood and how that impacted who she became on and off the court later on in her tennis career and even as a golfer. One thing that we didn't get to, though, is her later years in life living here in New Jersey. Her health really deteriorated and she actually was really broke. She didn't have a lot of money to help with uh, all the bills that came in with all of her health problems. And her Wimbledon and doubles partner, Angela Buxton, actually raised a million dollars in donations to help for her. For Althea Gibson? For, her for Althea camp. Gibson, yeah, to help her during that really tough time later on in her life. Um, I think it was in the in the late 80s and early 90s. So, you know, that it's uh, a part that we didn't get to in my, in my interview with Dr. Brown, but a really interesting part of her life later on here in New Jersey. You know, Jackie really set this up very well, and I'll tell you why. Remember them can only do so much. So Jackie covered what she could cover with uh, Dr. Brown, but the book, we also promote these books. You may, may or may not be able to see it behind me. It is simply called Serving Herself, The Life and Times of really the great Althea Gibson, the first African-American to win the Grand Slam, 1956. Um, died in East Orange, as Jackie said, uh, in 19, excuse me, 2003. But just an important figure in, a, not just African-American history, not just, I shouldn't say just, in American history, in world history, Althea Gibson, a great interview that my colleague Jackie Chicarico does with Dr. Ashley Brown. Check it out. In 1956, Althea Gibson became the first African-American to win the Grand Slam tennis event by capturing the French Open. Often called the Jackie Robinson of tennis, Althea Gibson not only broke the color barrier, she shattered it with her amazing feats. In 1957, she won her first of two consecutive singles championships and upon returning to the United States, was given a ticker tape parade in New York City and an official welcome at New York City Hall. She responded by winning the U.S. championships. For her accomplishments that year, Gibson earned the number one ranking in the world and was named the Associated Press Female Athlete of the Year, an award that she would again receive the following year. After finishing her remarkable career, Althea Gibson retired to East Orange, making New Jersey her home until her death in 2003. Hi, I'm Jackie Tricarico, and I am so pleased to be joined by Dr. Ashley Brown, who is the author of the new book, Serving Herself, The Life and Times of Althea Gibson, an assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jackie. Well, we're here to talk about Althea Gibson, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. But I'd first love to talk a little bit about her childhood and tell us how her childhood really shaped and molded her to become the athlete that she was. It's a great question. Althea Gibson was born in South Carolina in 1927. Her family migrated to New York in the early 1930s. And from the very start, she loved sports, played all kinds of sports and games. Uh, basketball, baseball, loved to play football with kids, became quite adept at paddle tennis, and that led her to tennis. And for her entire life, she was passionate about sports, playing them and then teaching them to others. And it wasn't just that she broke the color barrier in tennis, but in, in American sports in general, one of the first to do so, which was uh, an amazing accomplishment of hers. But also she really went against a lot of uh, stereotypical gender roles as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Oh, of course. Uh, many people during Gibson's lifetime, especially her, her early years, they felt that sports were only for boys and for men. And Althea Gibson didn't carry that idea. She came from a family in which her parents didn't inculcate her with that idea. So her parents seem to have been very open and accepting of her uh, preference for sports. She also preferred to wear shorts and pants, something else that was uh, thought of as taboo for girls and for women. But she felt that these uh, uh, outfits gave her better mobility and a better chance to be the best that she could be at the sports that she played. 
And I think she would argue, and many argue too, if she was a man, um, she would be heard of, of a lot more than she is, just like Jackie Robinson is for breaking the color barrier in baseball. So many people argue that if Althea Gibson during the time was a man, her name would be more well known, um, not just across tennis, but as uh, but across sports. But for Althea Gibson, what was it like for her personally um, when she became so successful? And um, was it a burden on her to to feel that responsibility that she had breaking the color barrier, like we said, breaking these gender roles, um, not just in tennis, but in, in sports in general? It was certainly a mixed blessing. Althea Gibson wanted to be the best at tennis, and she reached the number one ranking in 1957 and held it through 1958. But because she was a woman, and specifically an African-American woman who was playing so well and playing tennis so well, uh, she faced a tremendous amount of criticism, sometimes, sometimes from spectators at her tennis matches, uh, but especially from members of the media nationwide and even around the world because it seems that a lot of people just were not ready, they were not prepared for someone like Althea Gibson, someone who looked like Althea Gibson, to excel in the game of tennis. And you talked about some of those titles that she won. Can you go through some of those stats? Because I mean, it's so impressive. So many titles that she won and some of them so many, so many times over and over again through the years. Oh, certainly. So in terms of breaking barriers with uh, regard to race, first African-American to play at what is now the U.S. Open, the first to play at what is now Wimbledon, uh, the first African-American to win the Grand Slam tennis titles. So 1956, she wins now the equivalent of the French Open. 1956, she also wins the doubles title, first African-American to do that. And then her great years, uh, the U.S. Open and Wimbledon have always or generally been considered the best, the highest in terms of tennis matches to win. She won both the U.S. Open and Wimbledon in 1957, and then uh, successfully defended her titles in 1958. Uh, so this was, again, a tremendous athlete. I think she would have excelled at any sport that she played. And turns out she had another passion, golf. Althea Gibson went on to become the first African-American woman to compete on and then also to be a member of the LPGA Tour. So she was a golfer and a tennis player. And bringing it back to Wimbledon, I believe, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the first time that she won, the queen came out on the court and shook her hand. What was the significance in that? Oh, it was a major moment. And uh, for people who order the book and open it up, you'll see that I've got a picture of Queen Elizabeth presenting the Wimbledon trophy, the Wimbledon play to Althea Gibson. It was a, a tremendous moment. Althea Gibson was uh, a descendant of slaves. And here you have Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Wow, the symbol of so many things with regard to power and privilege in America, or pardon me, around the world. Uh, think about Britain and its colonies, the sun never setting on the British Empire. And here is Queen Elizabeth presenting that tremendous plate to Althea Gibson, whose parents had been sharecroppers. Uh, she had been very poor uh, during her upbringing in Harlem. And there she was on top of the world in tennis for everyone to see, meeting meeting royalty. It was definitely a huge moment in the history of sports. And her family, I know there was, talking about her family again a little bit, I know there was a, a lot of tension between her and her dad and her with, their up, with her upbringing. And she kind of ran away from home plenty of times to escape the abuse that she had at home. Talk about the family's um, encouragement uh, later on in her life as she's going through and winning all these and being so successful in tennis. Um, what was her relationship with her family as that happened? Another fabulous question. She had such a a nuanced relationship with her dad. Uh, he taught her to fight in terms of fist fighting, but also in terms of her mentality, not to take things for granted, I would say. Uh, and that is an attitude that she carried throughout her life in sports, but also in her other endeavors. Uh, her family, her mother was very supportive of her, um, but we also see that she wasn't really able to spend a tremendous amount of time with her parents and with her siblings because she was off chasing her dreams and her ambitions. I think that's something that many of your viewers might be able to identify with. And so she wrote letters home to her mother. Uh, she tried to keep the family as much as she could informed of, of what her activities were, uh, but she always had her dreams at the top of mind. And... Uh 
bringing it back to New Jersey, right? Uh, she moved to New Jersey after she got married. I think it was 1965. Yes. Moved to New Jersey. Talk about her connection to the great state of New Jersey and um, her her contribution to athletics here in the state. Wow. Uh, Althea Gibson's uh, relationship with New Jersey, it, it's long and it's deep. Uh, she married William Darwin, as you point out. He was from New Jersey. In 1970, Gibson uh, took some time away from the LPGA Tour uh, to become a recreational program leader in Essex County. In, 19, in the 1970s, the middle of the decade, she was the state athletic commissioner, uh, first African-American, first woman to hold that position. She served under Governor Brendan Byrne. Uh, and then in the 1980s and the 1990s, she was closely associated with and worked for governor's councils on physical fitness. So she definitely wanted the good folks of New Jersey to be healthy, to be strong, and to be active. And she used many of her, her later years carrying that message across the state. And I know part of the message too was to make sure that New Jersey stood out in athletics outside from the shadows of New York and Philadelphia, right? Just making sure New Jersey had its own place um, in sports, um, which we definitely do today. And I'm sure part of that is thanks to Althea Gibson. Um, so before we let you go, I, it's hard not to talk about the Williams sisters when we're talking about tennis. What was Althea Gibson's, um, how did they, how did she really influence the Williams sisters? Well, she loved the Williams sisters. And so in the later years of her life, when uh, she wasn't in the best of health, one of the things that she enjoyed doing was watching Venus Williams uh, tennis matches. And in the late 1990s, she had the great good fortune through a good friend of hers, Angela Buxton, of having a telephone conversation with Venus Williams. And she offered encouragement and support uh, that really only Althea Gibson could provide her because she had some sense of what Venus Williams might have been going through. But Venus Williams, something of a pioneer herself in tennis, along with her sister, Serena. Uh, and uh, when uh, Serena Williams, of course, won the U.S. Open in 1999. She was very happy, and she was also thrilled, of course, in the year 2000 when Venus succeeded so well and won at Wimbledon. Uh, so it's a it's a deep connection, and I think it was one that was meaningful to all three. And we just touched the surface, but um, if you, our viewers, want to learn more about Althea Gibson, you can now pick up Dr. Ashley Brown's book, the author of Serving Herself, The Life and Times of Althea Gibson. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for joining us. We really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for watching Remember Them. We'll see you next time. Remember Them with Steve Adubato and Jackie Tricarico has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSENG, NJM Insurance Group, RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Prudential Financial, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by bestofnj.com. To see more Remember Them programs, visit us online at steveautobato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. PSENG is building the utility of the future. A future where people use less energy and it's cleaner, safer, and delivered more reliably than ever. We are modernizing to lower emissions, support more renewables and electric vehicles, and reduce outages. And we are empowering our customers. At PSENG, we are powering progress. So you are breaking up with me? Well, yeah. Please do not tell me it is the policy puffin. Actually, it's NJM. 
Wow. They don't even have a mascot. That's kind of the point. Ouch. Well, I am not paying for dinner. Well, I'm saving money with NJM, so that's fine. This year, upgrade to NJM and see how much you could save. <laughs> no jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM, get a quote today.